confounding. So we need to make sure we understand some of the background and what's going on here. So let's get started. Um, he starts off by talking a lot about Second Temple Judaism. This is a phrase that he uses all the time, and he uses it like we all know what he means. So, what does he mean by Second Temple Judaism? Yeah. First century Judaism. Basically, first century Judaism. Second Temple would refer to the temple built after the exile, under the juris, you know, um, the oversight of Nehemiah, Ezra, this whole kind of the second temple, the post-exilic temple. And this is the temple, of course, that when they laid the foundations, what did all the old timers do? They wept. Why? Because it didn't come near to the glory of Solomon's temple. And I'm thinking, man, you guys really know how to rain on a parade, you know? <laughs> Here we are, founding the temple, and you guys just cry and because whine because it's not as good as the old days. Come on. You know, give me a break. But Second Temple Judaism, then, is the, um, Jude the faith that grew up after the exile down to the time of Christ. So we're talking about a 500-year period. What's important to recognize, and hopefully by now you're coming to recognize this, is that there is a marked difference between the faith of Israel and the faith of Jews. A marked difference. And in fact, if you pay attention, most of the OT guys will never talk about Jewish ideas. They'll talk about Israel. There's a big difference because something happened. There's a great big disjunction. And by the time you get down to Christ, the faith that was being believed was a big departure in many ways from the faith of Israel. So Second Temple Judaism is nothing more than trying to say this is the culture, the milieu, in which Jesus Christ entered. That's what's going on here. So Second Temple Judaism is basically shorthand for the theological, sociological culture into which Christianity was injected. That's what he's talking about. So why do we care about Second Temple Judaism? Because that's where all the first Christians came from. The first Christians came from here. And the way these guys understood God and God's work would be influential in a huge way on the first Christians because they were all Jews, including the... 12, and including Paul. Hugely influential. So, Balcom is interested in saying, what were these people believing? What was driving them? What was their understanding about things that mattered? All right, now what is his source for finding out about these guys and what they thought? Second Temple Judaism literature. A lot of it what we would call the Apocrypha. The books that were written during this intertestamental time that came down to us, sometimes extant, sometimes not. But these are the books that were very influential on them. And Stein is very, or Bauckham is very interested in studying them. Does he believe these are canonical books? Is that why Bauckham is studying them? No, it's not even the point. All he knows is that these books accurately reflect the thinking of the people of the time. And if you want to know what they were thinking, you read the literature and you start to get an idea of what they were thinking. So that's why he's interested in this material. He's not interested in it because it's canonical or because it's, you know, the apocrypha is really important. He's interested because for his purposes, it's critical because he's trying to understand what were the people thinking. All right? So that's the first point here. Now, the second thing we have to understand is, uh, Balcom, and, and we're going to just kind of walk our way through this thing here and kind of see how this goes. He's very interested then in this um, Jewish thinking of what these people were, what these people were thinking about. So we'll start here. So he says there were two really dominant ideas when it came to these. The, they're thinking about God, and the first thing is that they were strict monotheists. So they they had a absolute die-hard commitment to only one God, strict monotheist. And then the second thing that was a big part of their world at that time had to do with these, what might be called, um, <coughs> well, let's see how he puts it here. This is on page two. The um, beings of a semi-divine status, okay? That's kind of the term he uses. This idea of these kind of semi-divine intermediary figures. So these are the two things that are kind of critical for his discussion. All right, so he says, read the literature, learn about Second Temple Judaism, and what comes through here very clearly is they were, they were absolute strict monotheists, 
what comes through also very clearly is that they had a strong understanding of these semi-divine characters. Now, these semi-divine intermediaries break down into two categories, and he's going to talk about this later. What are the two categories? Patriarchal angels. All right. The first one is angels and patriarchs. And so, in a sense, you've got kind of um, Abraham or um, Moses kind of falling into this category. This, um, divinized patriarchs who kind of have this new role. So these angels and patriarchs. And the second category is the personifications of God. So the personifications of Yahweh. And these would be primarily the Word. And the other one, of course, is wisdom. There you go. All right. So these are the two categories this breaks down into. All right. Now, what Bauckham is arguing is that these ideas were really dominant and were driving things in this world at this time and in the, the, the way that people were thinking. They were strict monotheists and they had a great interest in the semi-divine beings. Now, the semi-divine beings, angels and stuff, well, this is part and parcel of apocalyptic literature, which is a lot, a lot of this apocryphal kind of stuff is. It's this apocalyptic literature, which happens when um, people are feeling a lot of pressure, they're feeling like they're on the outs, and they're wondering if God's really at work, and then the apocalyptic literature says, yes, God's in control, and it's going to be all right. And what's our primary example of apocalyptic literature in our Christian corpus? The book of Revelation. All right. Any angels in the book of Revelation? Yeah, a few. And it's the same kind of thing with this Jewish apocalyptic stuff, with this apocryphal. All kinds of angels, they show up all over the place. All right, so this is all pretty boring. It's like whatever. Now, here's where this gets interesting. The question now comes, and this is no longer a question of the first century, but now it's a question of the 19th and 20th and the 21st century. The question then comes, where did the church get the idea that Jesus was God? This is the driving question that's going on in this whole book, whether you know it or not. This is the driving question. Where did the church get the idea that Jesus is God? This is the big question. And the reason this question is kind of pointed and relevant for this discussion is because if the first followers of Jesus and the culture and context of Jesus' time were strict monotheists, then how in the world do they make room for Jesus in that world? And maybe the idea of some divine beings will help with an answer. That's what's going on here. And Balcom is writing to an academy that has been spending a long time thinking about these things and weighing them. And one of the dominant ideas in the academy is an evolutionary one. And the idea works like this. You have the first century <coughs> encountering Jesus. And so they encounter Jesus in his full humanity, and they say, wow, he's a remarkable guy. And so the assumption is, in the first century, the first Christians would have recognized Jesus as authoritative, and he was giving them their name and giving them their teaching, but just a man. And somewhere down the road, you get an evolutionary progressive thing, and when did the church finally decide that Jesus is God? Exactly. We can put a date on it. 325. 325 A.D., Nicaea. Because at Nicaea, we now have God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, the homoousian, full blast. There you have it. And the contention goes that it wasn't until Nicaea that the church really came clean and decided that Jesus is God. Okay? Now, this should sound familiar. This is the Dan Brown story. Okay? This is the idea that the church made it up, that the church decided that Jesus is God and started forcing the idea. Go ahead. Sorry. No, Josh has got his hand up. My question would be then, I... There would have... I... I, how would they have seen uh, those that would have held to this view, uh, the, the orthodox view of Jesus' uh, hum, uh, divinity, uh, as far as uh, those that uh, had uh, lobbied this, uh, in 325 to say he is God? I, I mean, if, I, if it didn't come into fruition until 325, mm -hmm. 
I, I mean, uh, how would he explain uh, oh, the uh, tension? Uh, how would those that hold to this explain the tension uh, that uh, was happening between things like the Aryan controversy? Well, Arius just kind of brings it all to a head. The, the, the theory goes like this. So the, Jesus lives and dies, and then people say, wow, that was pretty cool. And then as time goes on, they realize, wow, his teachings are so profound. We're going to start, we're going to promulgate these. We're going to teach them some more. And as time goes on, people are reflecting more on his stories. And they're realizing, you know, it'd be really good for our church and for our ability to do mission work if Jesus was really full of God. So let's just start kind of pumping him up a little bit. And so then the realization comes, you know, if we're worshiping him, we really need that he needs to be God to be worshipped. And so it just kind of comes to the conclusion that he needs to be God. And it's not necessarily insidious or nasty or conspiratorial, Dan Brown notwithstanding. It's just kind of the, the gradual growing and the evolution of a faith so that you go from a guy just being a really important, significant guy to being, I think he's God. And so that's the argument. And the assumption is that, of course, that's what must have happened. And it has to be that way because all the first century Jews were strict monotheists. There was no way they could say Jesus is God because their faith forbid it. This is the assumption, all right? So this is kind of the dilemma that Bauckham starts with. We know what the first century, Second Temple Jews were thinking about God, strict monotheists, and we also have the idea of these angels and stuff. And then we have this problem of Jesus, who eventually becomes God. Well, how do we get from Jesus and strict monotheism to God? So the assumption is gradual evolutionary process until it finally comes to a head at Anasian 325. That's the argument, okay? So what Bauckham is saying is, I'm going to do my book and my paper to argue against this assumption. That's his whole point. That's what he's going to try to do in this book, is try to argue against this and show where this comes short. That's his whole agenda. That's what he's up to. All right? With me? Okay. Good. Yes. You briefly alluded to this, and I'm sure you'll probably get there, but the semi-divine beings things, you said that was a solution that would probably help. Does that tie into this evolutionary concept, or are we going to get there? <laughs> it's, it, it fits into their theory. They, and, the, and we'll get into all, I'm not going to get into all of this um, quickly. Um, but the, the theory would go then that obviously, being strict monotheists, there's no room for Jesus in the Godhead. So, probably what happened was that the early church encountering Christ said, well, he's doing some pretty cool stuff. He's doing some almost godlike things. He probably belongs in the category of an angel or of, a, of a, one of the patriarchs, or intermediaries. And see, this even fits with um, you know, the Caesarea of Philippi. Who do people say that I am? Well, Elijah, one of the prophets come back. Ah, see? So, and the, and the, so the critics would say, you see, that's what's going on. They thought Jesus was an angel. And so they're already kind of exalting him more than just a dude. He's up now to the category of kind of semi-divine. And as time went on, he eventually got to fill the whole deal. And we just popped him up to Godhead. That's the, that's the theory. What's that? Well, don't get hung up on here yet. I'm just telling you the theories. Yeah, Jake. Jacob. You're good. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so his thesis appears, page four, top of the page, about six lines down. What has been lacking in the whole discussion of this issue has been an adequate understanding of the ways in which Second Temple Judaism understood the uniqueness of God. By acquiring such an understanding, we shall be able to see that what the New Testament texts in general do is take up the well-known Jewish monotheistic ways of distinguishing the one God from all the reality and use these precisely as ways of including Jesus in the unique identity of the one God as commonly understood in Second Temple Judaism. There's his whole thesis laid out right there for you. He's going to say, no, the whole idea of an evolutionary development is ruled out, is dead wrong. He's going to repudiate this, and he's going to do it by using these ideas. The very ideas that people use in their favor. He's going to turn them and use them in his, his, his approach. So that's what he's going to do. Now, <clears throat> before we get to that, we have to stop again and build a, more, a little more of our case. So he's going to argue that what you encounter in Second Temple Judaism is a strict monotheism. And then in one of his first sections, he starts to unpack how this works. This is page five and following. How does Jesus, our God's strict monotheism, show up? and the thinking of the, the people at this time. All right, we have the Shema, where hero is the Lord of God, the Lord is one. 
And we have the concept then of, and I'm going to run out of board space here real quickly so I have to erase stuff, so just hang on and try to remember everything. Um, he's going to build his case and say that what was going on was they had a clear understanding of God in his uniqueness as God, and this was clear in two major ways. One is that God alone is creator and ruler. That's kind of an A and a B. And that God alone receives worship. And because of these things, God alone is God. That's the argument. And these are the ways that this shows up. And it shows up when we have, Hero is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael Yehweh Eloheinu Yehweh Echad. One of my three Hebrew phrases. Um, that's the longest. Um, and so we have very clearly that God is one. And we also then have this affirmed again and again because of God's ruler and his fact that he is worshipped. Now, he also makes a point here, before we get too far afield, and there's so many things kind of coming all at once from Balcom, and we're going to try to pull this all together into a neat argument, and it does come together. He talks in here a lot about the difference between God's identity and God's nature. Now, what's he getting at when he makes this distinction? He's saying that basically the Jews living in Christ's time, and this would go even back to the Old Testament period, we're much more interested in the question of who about God than they were about the question of what about God. And the nature issue is a question about what. What is God? The difference here can be really nice to summarize, and be careful, these things are always prone to overgeneralization, but the difference is kind of between, between Jewish thinking and Greek or Hellenist thinking. So in the Old Testament, you have God creating God interacting, God hearing prayer, God answering prayer, God getting wrathful, flaring his nostrils, wiping people out, God doing stuff. So from that, do we learn about who God is? You bet. We learn about God being a personal God. We learn about God being involved with his creatures. We learn a lot about God's identity. So the identity goes with the idea of who God is. The Greeks approach this from a very different standpoint. They understand God because they're thinking about the idea of what God is the nature of God. And the difference is marked because for the Greeks, God essentially becomes a part of the creation, a necessary part. They arrive at God, they can go into a dark room, turn off all the lights, close their eyes, and just start to contemplate and think and realize things are. If things are, they must come from somewhere. There has to be a source. That source has to be foundational and, 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 and the very beginning. So what is that source? Where does everything come from? there must be some kind of unmoved mover, and we'll call it God. You see, they, they arrive at this need for God because the very existence of the creation demands it. But they're coming at it from a standpoint of what God is. Then they start thinking about what God must be like. Oh, he must be this, he must be this, he must be this, he must be this. And it's all based on idealism and on thinking and rational ideas. It's not based on what God is actually doing. The argument that Balkan makes is, basically, the Jews of Christ's time and before really never asked these kinds of questions. They didn't occur to them. They were never really very interested in what God is. They just knew He is. And they knew who He was. He is Yahweh. He is I am. He exists. And He's there in relationship with us, and that's who God is. So the question of identity was much more important than the question of nature. Now, it's going to be important later on, so we're going to come back to this again, because what Balcom will argue is that essentially Nicaea is not at all the church making up God's divinity and declaring it by fait accompli. What you have instead is really Nicaea is simply translating or transposing the idea of God's godness from a Jewish way of thinking and a first century Palestine way of thinking into a Hellenistic, more Western way of thinking. So in other words, we're now trying to answer the what question out of the context of faith. So what Nicaea is doing is not making up something new about Jesus, but simply explaining for the sake of a Western Hellenistic world what God's like, what Jesus is like. And this is exactly what plays out in the church's history from about 300 until about 500. You've got a 200-year period here of what we call the Christological controversies, where everybody knows Jesus is God, we're confessing it, but how can that be? He's a real human, he's really God. How can that be? And everybody starts coming up with their answers. Arius takes a run at it. Athanasius takes a crack at it. Then you've got Nestorius weighing in. You've got Eutyches weighing in. You've got the Apollinarians weighing in. Everybody's trying to take a run at how this works, what it means. And some of them are good, 
some of them are bad, and we just kind of keep on trying to sort this out. It's not as if the church finally decided, well, he's really God, so what does this mean? It's now asking the question, how does his godness fit into this Hellenistic world, and how do we explain it in a world that asks questions that we've never been asking before? That's what's going on. And that's why this distinction between identity and nature is so important. The basic argument Balcom is saying is nobody even cared in the first century in Judea to ask the question, what is God's nature? What is Jesus' nature? It didn't occur to them. They just knew what they saw, and they made, made their conclusions. But I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. All right? So we have here the basic criteria for God's godness. God is creator and God is ruler, and he alone is these things. All right, one more clarity here. This is in marked contrast, this idea and this identity idea is in marked contrast to the more Hellenized understanding, and it works something like this, because this plays into the idea of monolatry. And remember that word, which means what? Worship of one God, monolatry which is to be contrasted with idolatry. In idolatry, what do you do? Worship an idol. What's that? So in I idolatry, is worshiping an idol. In monolatry, you're worshiping one God, monolatry. And the way Balcom tells the story, which is the higher standard, monolatry or monotheism? Monolatry. monolatry. The worship of but one God is even more significant than just claiming there is one God because a lot of the more enlightened Greeks would claim a monotheistic understanding of things. There's only one God, but worship can be spread around. And this becomes because of their understanding of the concept of divinity. And it kind of shakes out like this. I shouldn't have erased that. I need to come back to it, but I did. We have this idea that um, we have a scale. Okay? And at the bottom of the scale would be beasts who have spirit because they live, but that's about it. And then next up on the scale would be us, humans, man. Man has a spirit, but man also has the ability to be rational and to think and to do things. So man is participating in some kind of higher order stuff. And then we have, next scale up, we have the um, demigods, okay? or the kind of sort of great guys. Um, in this category, classically, would be like Prometheus, you know, who um, steals fire from the gods. And he's really a human, but boy, he's kind of doing some really hip, cool god stuff. And then you've got even more higher level divine beings. And then you keep on your waking your way up the scale of Zeus. And eventually, then finally at the top, you have the really the fundamental, all ultimate thing, which we would call being God. The one God that is, the unmoved mover, whatever it is, the primary architect, whatever term you like, we have God at the top. But essentially, along the way, you have a gra graduated scale of divinity working your way up. So, who gets worship? Well, anybody on the scale can, as is appropriate. So, a demigod gets his level of worship, maybe 10% effort. The real god gets the whole thing, but then you get this kind of worship along the way. Monolatry would say, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope. only one that gets worship is God at the top. This should look familiar. Did you do this in Plaker in Systems 1? Because this is a big thing for Plaker. This is huge, 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 huge. Because what is going on here is this idea that somehow God is on the same scale. And this is the assumption of the West all the time. That God is the greatest thing that there is. The, th the thing that in which nothing can be greater can be con conceived, and on some notwithstanding. The problem with those ways of talking are you have God being the apex of the scale of greatness or divinity or of holiness or power. He's the most powerful. He's the most holy. He's the most great. Every one of those ways of talking is wrong because God's not on the scale. That's the big pow point here. When we start talking this way, we are doing a disservice to God because we're putting him on the scale and we're actually making him a part of the creation. God's got work to do. He, we need him. He's got things to do in the creation. He plays a role. The biblical understanding is completely at odds with this. Completely at odds with this. This is the idea of the kind of the Greek way of thinking. God gradually, you know, he's kind of, the, he's the very top, and we have this kind of graduated scale all the way up, things becoming more and more and more and more divine and greater all the way up. And what Balcom is saying is no Jew thought that way. 
It wasn't how they conceived of things. They understood things in a markedly contrasted way. You've got God, and then you've got everything else. You've got God, and you've got creatures, period. And in between, there is an impossible gulf that cannot be bridged by any graduated scale or any kind of ladder. It's just there. You've got God, and you've got everything else. And this is, trans this is what we try to convey when we talk about God being wholly other, with a W, wholly other. He's completely different. He's in a different category. He's not part of the creation. So God is not dependent upon the creation. He does not need the creation. And we desperately need him, but he exists apart from it. Before there's anything, there's just God. And if the universe disappears tomorrow, what about God? No big deal. God's still God, untouched, because God is God, wholly other. This is, wh this is why we are so reticent to make kind of arbitrary comments about, well, God is this, God is that, God is like this. Wow. What do you mean? And this is what you should have discussed last quarter when you talk about your God stuff. How, how confidently can we say things about God? Only to the extent that he's revealed it to us, and even then, can we say, that's exactly what God is like in total. Come on. What do you mean? God's God. And who are we to think we could possibly get our mind around God and say, there, I got them all figured out. And you don't. You don't. And this is what Plaker's book, in a magisterial way, really covers in his Domestication of Transcendence. He points out how Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, all of them were reticent to say anything too much about God because, hey, we're talking about God here. And that's where the whole idea of analogy, analogous, and, and analogy rather than univocity, remember that? Mm, yeah, bad memory, right? All right, so we have here this impossible gulf between God and creatures. That's part and parcel of this world. So strict monotheists, only God is God, only God is creator, only God is ruler, only God gets worship. And that's the whole point. So, back to our semi-divine beings. We've got two categories. The first category was angels and the patriarchs. And then the second category was the um, personifications of God. Right? Now, Balcom addresses this. And he says, in the first century Jewish way of thinking, did they recognize these angels and things? Yes. But were they semi-divine? No. In fact, the Jewish way of thinking says, I just encountered a being. I have two categories. He can either be God or a creature. Where do the angels belong? Creature. No question. They don't rise to the God stuff. And then Balcom gives us evidence that angels are never associated with creation. Angels are never associated with ruling. And angels never get worship. So the criteria is very clear. Only God gets these things. So while we have these semi-divine beings, they're not really semi-divine because they're not God in any way, shape, or form, period. That's the point. So that's the first category. Now we go to the second category, the personifications of God's being. Now what does Balcom say? Exactly. Now when the first century Jews would reflect on what's going on in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Proverbs, where you have wisdom being the first of God's creation, and God creating through Sophia, through wisdom. And you have the Logos, the Word of God, and God doing things through the Logos. And then Bakum says, well, all right, so how would those first century Christians or the first century Jews have handled these sections? Well, they would have looked at it and said, guess what? The Word of God and the wisdom of God are doing God's stuff. We only have two categories, creature or God, so where do those things belong? The God category. And that's why they are personifications or maybe intensifications of something in God's nature. So the wisdom of God is simply God's creative aspect at work for the sake of the world. But is it other than God? No. Is it an intensification of some aspect of God's being? That's the idea. But we don't really know much more than that. So we simply say these things, these personifications, belong in the God box, not in the creature box, but the two boxes stay separate. They, but to clarify, they wouldn't necessarily worship the God's wisdom or God's word or God's attributes. They would just put it <coughs> in the God box and worship the God box, right? Um, Not necessarily single out those attributes and worship them as some kind of peer or part of God. Yeah, okay, I would say so. But, see, you might even have the idea of the, um, the wisdom of God receiving glory. I mean, Proverbs talks about it this way, you know, the... You know, this, the Wisdom of God being, you know, worthy of praise and this kind of stuff. So there's maybe an aspect of it there. But the, I don't know if they would make a big distinction because if this is God, then what's the problem? Okay.
All right. So this is basically where he's going here. Um, page 10 and 11. Page 10, 11. There's a bottom is 10 into 11. He has this next summary. So the participation of other beings in God's unique supremacy over all things is ruled out in the case of creation by excluding them from any rule at all and in sovereignty over the cosmos by placing them in strict subordination as servants. So this is completely ruled out. And then he gets into this whole idea of the, um, the scale kind of thing on page 12, what I was talking about here with this graduated scale. Key statement, page 12, right below, um, right at the end of the first complete paragraph, he writes, Jews understood their practice of monolatry to be justified, indeed required, because the unique identity of Yahweh was so understood as to place him not merely at the summit of a hierarchy of divinity, but in an absolutely unique category beyond comparison with anything else. Exactly. This is exactly the point I'm trying to make. See, this is what Balcom is saying. All right, so then we go into this question about the intermediary figures, and he talks about this, and we have the two categories, and the thesis is laid out on page 14, and we're all good here. And he wraps everything up here, and we are now to page 17. We're clipping along because we need to. He wraps up this whole first section then with a nice summary paragraph on page 17, and the key part of it is the bottom point. This does not mean that wisdom is there envisaged as a subordinate divine being. It means that these Jewish writers envisage some form of real distinction within the unique identity of the one God. If so, they are not abandoning or in any way compromising the Jewish monotheism. The Second Temple Jewish understanding of the divine uniqueness does not define it as unitariness and does not make distinctions within divine identity inconceivable. It perfectly, and it's perfectly clear distinction between God, all the reality is made in other terms, which in this case places God's wisdom unequivocally within the unique divine identity. All right, so we're all good here so far. We've got all these kind of ideas working here, and this is the context in which now Jesus is going to appear and begin his ministry.